into the, the, the farthest reaches of human knowledge. How's that, Bernadette? For putting, <laughs> <laughs> putting you on a Sorry, spot. I, I can't fill those shoes. You can't go there. Uh, Bernadette Highland. Uh, so, Bernadette, if you're yep. uh, able to come up and uh, share with us your, your perspective. Um, Great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Now you're going to put me on the spot, though, because I'm a window. I'm a Mac user. I know. I sorry about that. Get rid of these. It's funny. I, I'm I'm uh, organizing two sessions for SSP. All of these sessions typically presume that speakers will use the PC that's provided. Every speaker on every panel was a Mac user. <laughs> <laughs> what does that, that say? That tells you something, I think. <laughs> So he reaches morning. from beyond the grave. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, thank you very much for this opportunity and for pulling together this, uh, this panel. Um, we, we had a uh, preliminary discussion to organize ourselves, but I, I actually wonder whether I shouldn't have gone first because it was hammered into me by Bill not to be too technical. Um, and I think Shivaram got more, much more technical. Than uh, that's actually <laughs> true. Sorry about that. <laughs> so um, just by way of quick introduction, I'm speaking here really primarily with my hat on as an advocate of uh, the, the standards uh, approach, a standards-based approach to sharing and reuse of data. I serve as the uh, co-chair of the W3C Government Link Data Working Group and have been in, uh, involved in helping uh, describe the charter for a, uh, a new working group that actually is getting kicked off this week and will be announced, I'm sorry, next week, announced at the Semantic Technology Conference in San Francisco. Uh, and two of the, ch the two chairs or co-chairs of that organization are from Oracle and IBM. The Semantic Web, just very, very briefly, I'm sure everybody's heard of it, uh, but it always means different things, and I find that's rather ironic that uh, there are many PhDs <laughs> who argue about the meaning of what the Semantic Web is. But simply put, it's about common formats for integration and description of data. And uh, so oftentimes, broadly, the problem we're trying to solve using semantic uh, technologies is the ability to share disparate information across uh, the web. And um, uh, of course, we're addressing the issue of silos inside the enterprise, as well as um, disparate data sources that are able to be reached via the World Wide Web. Um, I, I realized it's important to define terms. I recently returned from an EPA conference in um, Research Triangle Park in North Carolina two weeks ago where uh, I spent quite literally three hours with a, a team of distinguished PhDs in the fields of human health and environmental sciences on what the word data and models mean. <laughs> so, just for, I know that scientists have sometimes a very specific uh, use of the term data and models. Uh, to them, it can be spreadsheets and databases, etc. But I'm talking about data in the most sort of granular uh, sense, it, it, uh, things that exist or concepts that exist. And when we talk about linked data, we're talking about a mechanism or a model to describe how data is related to one another. We've heard and we all know that data is really flowing. Shivaram just tossed out the fact that they're dealing with two terabytes of data. Uh, so it's, it's, there's an enormous amount of data, and, and now the question is how do we even begin to get data that we're creating, as, say as human health scientists or environmental scientists, uh, rather than being able to pick up the phone. Here, here's a really interesting thing I learned from this conference. A lot of people in that community who are PhDs and have very, very impressive bios, I, I was actually reading their bios and I was feeling quite intimidated by this, this, the group of people that I was going to be speaking with. And my colleague, my CTO, said, well, you know, it takes 30 years to build up a, a bio like that. And then one of the early speakers at the conference said the average age of the community that, that was attending the Society of Toxicology uh, presentation was over 50. And that community largely knows who to pick up the phone and talk to. But today's uh, research scientists and scholars are often in their 20s and 30s, and they grew up with um, Google and, and web. And uh, they, they don't, if you can't find it on Google, it might as well not exist, which is kind of a horrifying thought. 
So linked data is about data that is reusable. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's free and available on the web. Lots of implementations using linked data are available behind the firewall and are used for internal workflow annotation systems by healthcare life sciences you know, groups. Um, so just I want to clarify that when we, we, we do have a term called linked open data, and I'll talk about that in a little bit a little, little uh, later in the discussion. But uh, linked data is just about making data reusable. The good news is we're living in a golden age. Uh, the, however, things feel like they're moving so quickly that you know, we wonder how we're going to even participate in what potentially feels like a, a race where it's, it's the, the front of the line is just getting ahead of us quicker and quicker. So providing a little bit of context um, around this is helpful. And what, what linked data is about is providing context to our data. I started my life in the field of, uh, I'm a computational linguist by training, and I started a software engineer working on uh, uh, relational database-backed applications. And when I was developing a new application, I had the um, luxury of being able to go talk to the enterprise DBA and get a copy of the logical schema of the data. In the world of linked data, we are assuming that you don't have the opportunity to go talk to a database administrator or an enterprise architect about the form of the data, that the data is self-describing and the schema effectively is built into the data representation itself. So it gives context to the data. I like this quote by Samuel Johnson, the 18th century um, uh, uh, author, and he says, knowledge is of two kinds, that which we can know ourselves or that uh, the, or knowledge that we know where to find the information. And clearly in the 21st century, we're living in the era of search. But it that's, has some detrimental effects, as we all know, for scholarly, uh, for scholarly research, for SDM uh, publishers, and, uh, uh, you know, because the Google doesn't search the deep web. So there's a group uh, that started actually back in 2006, the first uh, use of the term that I'm aware of uh, by Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the web uh, and head of the World Wide Web Consortium was linked data. So it was really started by a group of people, Tim inspired, who were academics in the UK and in the United States. And they started uh, publishing data in a reusable format on the web. And in the short course of five years, it's grown from the effort of a few academics to a cloud of linked data that is growing exponentially. And we'll just get rid of this little box. Um, uh, what have I just done by doing that? Hmm. So a couple of these firms you might have heard of before. <laughs> They're all using linked data, and they have been for the last three, four, five years. Um, retailers have by far and away seen the benefit of publishing data or metadata about their data for reuse. I remember, I must admit, the first time I heard Best Buy, the story of Jay Myers at Best Buy, who was an IT uh, manager, and he, he basically started publishing data about um, appliances that Best Buy sells and putting that data and making that data available via an API, I wondered, why would you do that? You know, isn't that giving a lot of competitive intelligence to Sears and, and other um, retailers? But in fact, they, they learned some fascinating things. I don't have time to go through a, a case study of Best Buy, but they tried it, and uh, they found that, that, that organizations or people, consumers, do research about a washing machine before they go buy it, and they look at testimonials of other people who have bought that model of a washing machine or a mattress or whatever, and they're much more likely to buy something once they do the research. And a very high percentage of people uh, do, in fact, um, do research about appliances and mattresses before they buy it. I'm sorry, I put the word book publishers. I know, I know all these organizations publish many more things besides books, so I'll have to fix that. Um, but, and this is just, there, there are many more publishers who are using linked data, uh, but these are just a representative handful. And they're using it to, uh, as Shivran uh, indicated, improve internal uh, workflow and data management, and then provide better customer, uh, better services uh, to their and content to their uh, to their subscribers. Uh, we had uh, the head of the VP of uh, 
um, global product strategy for Walters Kluwer uh, and, and head of competitive intelligence speak on yesterday's uh, government linked data working group call and uh, he talked a lot about the hybrid approach that Walters Kluwer is, is uh, uh, beginning to develop where they're using linked data and combining it with software applications. So pretty much <laughs> by way of really interesting history, the company that I co-founded back in 2001 time frame uh, dealt with, met we called it metadata management for large data sets. And uh, we developed a product which turned out to be the first commercially supported RDF database. And in 2003, which venture capital, we went around and talked to all the publishers and there are many of the publishers, not all the publishers, but many of the large publishers who said, well, this is a really interesting idea about a graph database and being able to search things semantically. But, you know, really, Oracle's doing everything that we need it to do right now. <laughs> and it's so critical to us that if we were interested, and we are interested in what you're talking about, we'd have our PhDs deal with it. We really wouldn't sort of buy software from you. And um, so, you know, we didn't let the door hit us on the way out, but they showed us the way out. And just because of timing, uh, it was the U.S. intelligence community who was very interested in graph database technology and uh, absorbed it very readily and later absorbed our company in 2005 uh, through acquisition. But uh, uh, why I diverge, I don't know. But uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's been a long time in the it's been a long time in the process. This whole concept of using linked data in a graph database. Uh, it has been hard. I will say it's been described and made out to be hard, and, I'll, and I just want to put a little bit of a note as to why that is, because I wondered about it, because I've worked with a lot of PhDs, and I'm not a PhD, and I wonder why do they make this stuff sound so difficult to use and, and so esoteric? And the reason why is the funding for early research in semantic technologies emerged after a lot of AI money dried up, and so it was PhDs in AI and computational linguistics and uh, logicians who got funding from various, uh, from DARPA and NSF, et cetera, in this field. And so they had to demonstrate they were doing new and novel research and making this stuff hard, which was why it was hard for, and, and they didn't have, they don't have marketing expertise, but God bless them, they, they stepped in and tried to be, you know, PhDs and do deep and difficult things as well as market this technology. Um, and no, you know, the reason why it's not really marketed well is because no vendor owns it, which is the power and the beauty of it. But uh, anyway, lots of smart people at those new media and publishing organizations picked it up, as well as the U.S. intelligence community. Um, and it's really thriving. So if, if you have not heard of linked data and this is the first time you're hearing about it, that's good. I'm glad. Um, and you'll certainly be hearing a lot more about it. Uh, at that EPA conference that I was recently at, they're very excited. The scientific community is very interested in uh, using this to be able to publish metadata about large data sets they're working on. Some of them are so large that now they're, they're working with supercomputers and crunching big data sets. But even to know that someone at Caltech is working on a particular project because they published general information about their project and then they'll know maybe to pick up the phone or text uh, the, 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 uh, this, this, the team that's working on the project is valuable. So I would say this goes beyond the pain point of just scholars, but the pain point is they have very, very valu valuable information. They often can't share or exchange those data, data sets short of uh, sending, uh, you know, via an FTP site, a data file or a uh, spreadsheet um, or databases. And uh, even hard drives oftentimes get shipped via FedEx. And via the web, we now have the ability to push content up to the cloud and be able to com do computation on the cloud. Uh, sometimes it's within closed and trusted circles of other professionals, other societies, et cetera, not on the general uh, open um, internet. But the focus is using linked data to um, access and using uh, shared vocabularies, uh, be able to reuse and mash up those data sets. Publishers, of course, I'm, I'm not going to tell you your business, are often looking to uh, combine these data sources uh, to improve the quality of the data, uh, to uh, make this data more easily uh, usable uh, by your customers uh, in marketplaces. Elsevier showed a lot of uh, leadership in this area several years ago. I worked with um, uh, Raphael City's group uh, on, on Science Direct, which is now Cyverse, on uh, the marketplace for data and applications and it was all using a linked data or an RDF-based approach. 
Um, I hope you like this slide as much as I do, but I like yellow labs a lot. Um, there's certainly lots of, there's, 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 there's oftentimes lots of uh, uh, tension in an organization. Uh, so linked data is not the silver bullet, but uh, there's a profound beauty to the fact that no vendor owns it, it's not proprietary, and there's a worldwide organization who's defining the standards and working generally quite collaboratively to do so. Uh, so, but within your organization, there are going to be tensions uh, between different different facets or different or parts of the organization on how much data to release, uh, what to share, what not to share. Uh, those don't magically go away, but at least linked data or linked data approach facilitates the sharing of data. You know, you're basically using this to incentivize uh, and and make your data uh, searchable and uh, be that on Google or on uh, uh, proprietary uh, platforms. I'm very going to focus on linked data. Uh, obviously that is uh, on the web is a, is a, is a, is a, with an open license is what we call one star linked data. Tim Berners-Lee described the five, the five star rating system. Two stars is it's, hey, it's machine readable data. And so what this means is lots of organizations have portals where they have the data in an Oracle database or, or IBM, and, uh, and then they, they convert the data and they make it available as a web page. Well, that's great, and I as a citizen, if I, for example, want to type in my zip code or put in a term, can find the information on and, and view it in a human readable web page. But if I'm a scientist and I want to repurpose that data, uh, or a policymaker, and I want to be able to use that data and mash it up with other data, then I'm, I have to resort to screen scraping, which most people don't know how to do, nor do they want to do, and, and, and wouldn't do in many cases, because it's, 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 the license is not clear as to whether or not you're allowed to do that. In many cases, you're not. So linked data is all about human and machine-readable data. Uh, if you publish data, say, as PDF, that's a non-proprietary format, that's good, and that's three-star linked data, and certainly the world of open data is, is predominantly uh, published as PDF. But where we want to push to is having data published in RDF and ideally interlinked with a couple of other data sets via RDF. And a lot of healthcare life science data is available as four and five star linked data. They were certainly the community after the intelligence community who hopped on to the semantic technology or more specifically linked data bandwagon uh, uh, early in the piece. So a lot of taxonomies and ontologies are in fact defined as linked data and available. It would be great uh, what Thane is talking about that would be incredibly powerful and useful. So why linked data matters? It scales to web scale. Uh, the web is arguably, it is, the, the world's largest IT system. It's never gone down, it's very robust, um, and linked data is all about the web of data. So it's all about being able to reuse content off the, off the web, even if it's behind a firewall, it might be in your internal organization, being able to reuse it. Uh, this is just a human, obviously, a human readable, uh, pretty web page about a mallard duck. And under the covers is RDF. That's what it looks like. So I just don't want to make it sound like this abstract thing and use an acronym. And acronym. By the way, RDF stands for Resource Description Framework, and uh, it is the standard defined by the W3C about how to publish data on the web. But that's what it looks like under the covers. So when you, when you publish data in RDF format, if you point a web browser at it, it looks like that pretty HTML page. And under the covers, if you point a linked data client or a software program at it, it looks like that. We've seen this model before with credit cards. It's a human re readable interface on the front and a machine readable interface on the back. There are books about it, right? So it must be ready for prime time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the uh, government linked, uh, linking government, uh, sorry, linking enterprise data book was published by Springer in 2010. Uh, I have a, it's a, these are obviously peer reviewed books. And uh, those details about 14 different large production deployed implementations using a linked data approach uh, from the uh, BBC through the uh, French utility company Electricité de France, which is the largest utility company in the world. Uh, in 2011, in November, uh, we published, uh, my CTO is the editor, uh, linking government data, and those are all examples around the world of governments who are using linked data to publish authoritative content. This is the data landscape that many people who are in, a, in, an, in an IT role or in an information management role are familiar with on the right in the green. 
uh, they're familiar with uh, relational databases, XML databases, uh, CRM systems, uh, business intelligence systems. And on the left is the world of semantic technologies, which encompasses the semantic web and linked data and linked open data and linked enterprise data. There's a little overlap there. Yeah, I mentioned this earlier. There's going to be contention. Expect this. I like um, Stephen Johnson's book, Where Good Ideas Come From. In his first chapter, he challenges people to think about uh, why some ideas go viral. So uh, this, these two slides seem to really resonate with publishers that I've spoken to in the past. HTTV was a 20-year effort with tens of millions of dollars worth of government funding that, that went towards it. YouTube was effectively an overnight success in two years. And the reason why, uh, you, could, you could both with YouTube and HDTV, you could watch videos. But with YouTube, you were able to take, you know, from a grassroots perspective, you could publish your own videos. You could change, you could rate them, and you could discuss them. The analogy is linked data to relational databases. We can use data, right? But, but the use of that data with a relational database or an XML database is often confined to programmers and people who know how to manipulate the data. Linked data, however, like YouTube, allows us to use the data, publish it, share it, reuse it, do mashups, uh, rate it, um, and that's very, very, very powerful. And that's why I contend the linked data cloud has really grown exponentially over the last five years. Uh, this um, uh, architecture, architecture, uh, actually it's an architecture diagram by Brad Allen from Elsevier Labs uh, is out in, um, in public domain. And I really like it because I think, I don't know, how many people here look at that slide and say, I can relate to that and we're doing something like that? So it's by show of nod of heads. Is that, does this kind of look like something you all are involved in? But the funniest thing, because we do some professional services work, we're a, prof we're a product company, is everybody thinks they're unique, you know? And so like they, they, they kind of tailor it and say, this is, you know, the Elsevier way, or this is the Walters Kluwer or Springer. And uh, what I find interesting, and I appreciate this slide, is everybody's doing the same thing. Um, and, uh, you know, but how you do it, uh, is different. And some are leveraging open source, some are building it entirely from the ground up. Um, uh, companies that we're working with are oftentimes incorporating infrastructure platform. There's an open source project that we're very active in called Kalamakis. It's a linked data management platform. And that's a little bit of a new term, so I want to I define it. Uh, a linked data management system compares to a content management system in that we're in a linked data environment typically working with structured content. There's a thin veneer of unstructured content on a linked data management system um, versus with content management system, we're often dealing with mostly unstructured data and a little bit of structured data uh, as metadata. Kalamakis, just to, to introduce you to it, is a framework for building data-driven applications. It would be perfect for what Thane is talking about with uh, taxonomy commons. Um, so we have to have a discussion after today's talk, Thane. Um, and it allows web developers to easily create data applications uh, for the web. And you use a web browser to actually build it. It's all standards compliant, XHTML. Uh, JavaScript and CSS buys you a Kalamakis application that built on linked data can be built in quite literally days uh, in days. You know, there's, there's yet to be a, a Kalamakis based web app, the data driven web app that's taken us more than three to five days to build once you have it in the format of, of uh, linked data. And it doesn't mean that in any way you're replacing your relational or your XML databases. There's a simple transformation layer that, that happens to convert the data uh, into RDF. Um, Kalamakis Enterprise is a commercially supported version of the Kalamakis open source project that, that our company uh, uh, provides. Uh, this is an example of some of the customers that we're working with on Kalamakis-based um, applications. The government printing office. Uh, has an extensive uh, uh, PERLs, uh, persistent URLs infrastructure in place that we run for them in a production basis. Uh, the US EPA um, has committed to publishing key data sets that they are responsible for, like the facilities registry, which uh, shows the, all the um, facilities across the United States that the EPA is responsible for monitoring, from dry cleaners to uh, uh, nuclear power plants. And if more of that data is available as linked data and can be mashed up, for example, with data that Health and Human Services or um, other, other government authorities 
uh, are publishing, you can build very, very powerful mashups very, very quickly and obviate the need for building a data warehouse. So this is really of interest to organizations, again, who their solution in the past has been, let's build another data warehouse. That's often expensive, $30 million, and two years is the average cost and time frame to implement a data warehouse project. And there's nearly a 50% failure rate oftentimes with data warehouse projects. So linked data is seen as a very promising uh, way. We, we're very involved in a number of uh, replacements of data warehouses um, to combine multiple disparate data sources using a standards-based approach. And there's no vendor lock-in because your data is in a standards format. So as I think all of the speakers have indicated, um, using this new uh, approach, and it's not really that new, it's five years old, or really the concepts are 20 years old, uh, but the standards are very, very mature. Uh, it does require uh, intelligent people to be working cooperatively with subject domain experts in, in your organization. Um, however, the benefits of implementing or um, having your data available as linked data are very, very, very powerful for the purposes of uh, reuse and sharing. Obviously, all companies have to go through and are continually going through the process of determining what that balance is between openness and protected content, distributed versus controlled, uh, standardized versus more loosely coupled um, uh, relationships with their data. So this is my closing slide. Uh, I've touched on a number of these things. I didn't go into detail on URI policy and strategy, but that's an important component of uh, going forward with a um, uh, reuse of data policy and plan within your enterprise. Um, there are best practices that are being published. Uh, currently, uh, some organizations feel standards bodies are slow moving. Um, I don't in the W3, uh, I, don't, I don't ascribe to that philosophy. The best practices are being written by some of the earliest pioneers who have deployed systems. And now we're going back and saying, here's how you do it so that the early mainstream can adopt it. Um, so those uh, are, are, are being developed. It's usually a cooperative effort between um, W3 members. W3 is an interesting standards organization. They, they publish all the standards for the web that are used on the web today. Many product vendors are part of it, academic institutions. They have about 300 members worldwide. If you're not a W3 member and you're a publisher involved in publishing, I uh, strongly encourage you to take a look at um, how you might get involved. And they have all sorts of tiers of entry. I, I'm not paid by the W3. I'm a, I'm a volunteer uh, and, a, and a chair of a working group. Um, but it's a very, very useful uh, community in which to participate to leverage the, the brains trust of people who are involved in this, in, in academic research, leading edge academic research, uh, through uh, product development the, 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 at the caliber of uh, IBM and, and Oracle and other large companies. And I want to just highlight or reiterate Thane's point. Vocabularies exist for much of this stuff. For, for a lot of the basic things that you would define a taxonomy for, someone else has already done it. You're really not that unique. Um, you know, how the business, uh, how that those terms and that uh, the relationships relate to other uh, uh, aspects of your business, that is unique. And you should have ontologists potentially within your organization uh, working on that. But controlled vocabularies and <coughs> basic things about people and organizations and assets that you manage, that's all, that's all well-trodden territory. And if you're going to take a linked data approach, the power of it is being able to reuse those vocabularies. <clears throat> Thanks very much. My presentation's on SlideShare. Um, I don't know what the it policy is. It will be through SSP okay. as well. Okay, great. Thank you very much.